communications director, and I'm also a uh, health uh, policy advisor at the Alliance for Health Reform. Uh, we are based in Washington, D.C. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and our mission is to educate uh, uh, con uh, congressmen, congressional staff, journalists about health care policy. Uh, we are partnering with the Association of Healthcare Journalists um, to uh, conduct these briefings around the country and cities around the country uh, in preparation for the big changes that are coming for the, um, for the ACA, the um, Affordable Care Act. And uh, our underwriter for these events is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, so we'd like to thank them for their support of these briefings. So, um, we're here to talk about these big changes. We keep hearing 2014, everything is, is going to come down in 2014, but as probably everyone in this room knows, it's not 2014, it's October 1st. Uh, the doors open October 1st, uh, and every state has to be ready at that time to enroll. So uh, what does that mean? It means everybody has to be ready even before October 1st, and there are big changes. What do we know? Uh, we know specifically about Pennsylvania and New Jersey that both states are getting ready for federal exchanges to come in. We know that uh, Pennsylvania is not moving forward with the Medicaid expansion. We know that New Jersey is moving forward with the Medicaid expansion. The implications for all that, what I just said, for, for both of those, are uh, huge. So we have a, a fabulous lineup of speakers to talk about the implications, the challenges, and what this all means. So to my far right is Karen Pollitt. She is Senior Fellow at the Kaiser Family Foundation in Washington, D.C. Uh, she directs and sponsors research related to consumer protections and transparency in private health insurance. Before she came to Kaiser, Karen served as the director of the Office of Consumer Support at the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight, CSIO, at the Department of Health and Human Services. The, that agency was created after the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act uh, was, um, uh, was enacted to implement provisions affecting private health insurance. So uh, she has a long list of credentials. I'm not going to go through all of them. In your packets, you have uh, full bios for all of the speakers, but I'll just give you the highlights. She's uh, done quite a bit of insurance work at Georgetown University. Um, she has spent some time at HHS. She has been with uh, Senator Rockefeller on Capitol Hill. She's been with Congressman uh, Sandra Levin on Capitol Hill. She's been with the American Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, to my immediate right is Jerry Katz. He ha is a longtime uh, con a hospital consultant right here in Philadelphia. He is currently the owner of Healthcare Management Consulting. He's been doing that for about 30 years, and he has uh, been consulting for more than 300 hospitals and healthcare organizations uh, across the country. Uh, before that, he spent about 17 years in management positions in hospitals in uh, both New York and Pennsylvania. He has also been adjunct faculty at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. To my left is Uber Reinhardt. He's the James Madison Professor of Political Economy and Professor of Economics at Princeton. He's the past president of the Association of Health Services Research and chairman of the International Advisory Group of Academy Health. Uh, again, like everyone up here, a long list of credentials. I'm just going to give you some, a few of the highlights. In 2006, uh, Governor Corzine in New Jersey appointed him to chair the Health Reform Commission for the state. Uh, he, has, uh, he has been on the uh, advisory board of, uh, well, he has served on what is now called MedPAC, the uh, board that uh, advises Congress on uh, Medicare policy. Um, he has uh, quite a number of other uh, accomplishments. You can read about it in your bio. To my far left is Carl Stark. He's an award-winning journalist for the Philadelphia Inquirer. He's assistant managing editor for Health and Science. 
He has um, uh, covered. He has been a business reporter. He has uh, covered. He has been uh, pharmaceuticals reporter, national foreign editor. He is also vice president of the Association of Healthcare Journalists, who is our partner in this event. So I'm going to turn it over to Carl just for a minute to talk just briefly about the Association of Healthcare Journalists. Well, I'm assuming we have a lot of members in the room of the association. Sure. Um, HCJ is the national group of health reporters. Um, the whole point of it is to raise the level of, is to raise the level of health reporting. Um, we have lots of tip sheets. Um, there's a list served. You can get questions answered. You can put up questions in the morning and, and get get it in front of a, like 1,500 reporters and get answers like in a few hours. Um, I just it's a great it's a great resource. They, we also have a blog on, on health reform. So um, if you haven't joined, um, I'll I'll personally come after you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm going to turn uh, this over first to Karen Powlitz. Uh, each of our speakers is going to uh, talk to us briefly, maybe seven or eight minutes, about uh, a particular area about implementation of the health care law. Uh, and then we're going to uh, leave a lot of time for question and answer here. So uh, Karen is, and, and all of them are going to try to do their best to give us a lot of ideas about uh, where, where they see the, uh, the best ideas for reporters to be covering this issue as we move forward. So Karen's going to talk to us about the insurance aspects of this, the, the big insurance changes, and uh, what we can expect from federal exchanges. Good evening. So I'm going to focus largely on what will be going on in the non group market, the individual market, uh, because that's where the most dramatic changes are. I have to keep pinching myself because this is and will continue to be the smallest kind of source of health insurance in the United States. Most of us get coverage um, at work. Yes, we're most non-elderly uh, get their health insurance coverage. And the reason for that is that it tends to be pretty comprehensive, uh, pretty highly subsidized. Our employers kick in most of the premium and the IRS helps as well. Um, uh, and uh, it is not allowed to discriminate against you. So it's a good place to go if you've got pre-existing conditions or if you're pregnant. Um, uh, the next kind of biggest source of coverage uh, is uh, public coverage, the Medicaid program in particular, the safety net for low-income people, also obviously very heavily subsidized, very comprehensive in their coverage. Um, people that don't qualify for a public program or for coverage at work um, end up having to shop on their own um, in the individual market. Uh, not very many people are successful, though it's only about 5% of the non elderly who are there now. Um, and then another group that looks a lot like them is the uninsured, um, who also tend to be people who are not eligible for job-based coverage or for public programs. So big changes um, coming um, and fixing the individual market, which is kind of the weak link in the private coverage change. Um, that's going to happen through a couple of ways. You've probably heard um, uh, the individual market today. Um, well, how many of you are from Pennsylvania? And how many from New Jersey? Okay, so I'll temper a little bit what I'm going to say. Um, so the individual market does work a little bit differently state by state. Mostly it's underwritten, so it will turn you down um, if you're sick um, or if you have uh, a high health risk, um, uh, and that has to stop in 2014. Uh, it, because it's not subsidized and because insurers and because it's voluntary, insurers are worried that people don't want to spend too much. They try to hit kind of a low price point and sell inexpensive coverage today. Um, it's hard to make health insurance inexpensive unless it doesn't protect you very much. And so you tend to find in the individual market, um, policies are very different um, in terms of what they cover, almost as different as snowflakes and the protection that they offer you less about how long. So, um, so that all has to change. That's a dramatic transformation. So the non-group market has to start covering stuff um, and not having $10,000 deductibles. Um, it has to take people regardless of their health status. Um, and, and keep them as long as they want to stay. Uh, to stabilize that market, people will be required to have coverage, and then there will be um, significant uh, subsidies available to help them afford coverage. Uh, sliding scale based on income offered through the exchanges. Um, I think, Uva, I heard you were going to talk a little bit about rate shock, so I'll maybe leave that uh, for you to expound on. But suffice it to say, when you take um, plans today, 
that won't cover people when they're sick and then won't cover what people need when they're sick um, and make them stop doing that. Um, uh, that you've enhanced the protection and so the value of that coverage. So we expect to see prices moving in the individual market, but what direction they move in kind of depends on where you started. In New Jersey, um, for almost 20 years now, um, it has been the law that insurance companies can't turn you down if you're sick. Um, in the non the market, they have to guarantee issue coverage, they have to community weight coverage. Um, and in a voluntary, unsubsidized market, that has kind of turned the individual market into an unsubsidized high risk world. Health insurance is really expensive in New Jersey. Um, and the expectation is when the subsidies come in and now everybody comes in, those rates are probably going to come down. In Pennsylvania, there's a mix of policies. The Blue Cross plans are required to sell insurance to everybody, or at least to sell some of their products to everybody. There's not a requirement about what they have to cover, though. So some of these guaranteed enrollment products are a little skinny in terms of what they cover. Um, they leave out kind of key benefits. So um, uh, and they tend to be very expensive. So people who are in those policies now or looking at those policies now may see the world as being a lot more pleasant and friendly and affordable um, in 2014. People who are in these um, other policies that can be sold in Pennsylvania that can turn you down, that don't cover anything, that maybe only cost $75 a month if you're in your 20s, um, you know, the rate for that will go up. But again, there will be subsidies available. Um, as you're kind of looking at the changes that are going on in the marketplace, it might be good now um, to just start looking around and seeing what's for sale. You can look, uh, they're, you know, they're not, it's not as comprehensive. Um, you can look on eHealth Insurance or Quotesmith or on the insurer's own websites, you know, just go in and click and make yourself different people. <laughs> you know, I'm a family, I smoke, I'm 20, I'm 40, I'm male, I'm male. Um, and just see kind of what do the policies look like. Um, and, um, and then download some of them. <laughs> um, so when we start seeing kind of what's going to move, it would be interesting to have kind of a baseline about what's there. Plans are supposed to be offering now um, a summary of benefits and coverage, a standardized summary, um, so that if you start to download these, you actually could set them up on a spreadsheet pretty easily because the information that you're looking for is always in the same place. So, um, uh, so you might want to look at those. Um, uh, and just kind of see what's moving. Now, um, uh, just one other thing about the shopping. So, so what people are going to buy is going to change. It's going to be more protective. Um, there's going to be kind of a big one-year adjustment in prices where you know all of the prices kind of um, move to the mean, and um, uh, and then they should you know kind of stabilize uh, going out into the future. Um, how people are going to come to this market is going to be kind of interesting as well. Um, Anybody can come to an exchange and buy health insurance if they want to, but not anybody can get a subsidy. So um, in order to keep the cost of the subsidy program down, the Congress wanted to make sure that this kind of continued to be this coverage of last resort. So in order to qualify for subsidies on the exchange, you're going to have to go through an eligibility process and establish that First, you're a citizen or living here legally. Second, that you're not eligible um, for subsidized coverage offered to an employer that meets certain standards. And you're not eligible for a public program like Medicaid or Medicare. Um, and then you're going to have to um, estimate information about what your income is going to be next year in 2014. You're going to have to estimate that this October. Um, that may be easy for some people who have a steady salary, but a lot of people who have a steady salary get benefits at work, so they won't be doing this in the first place. So um, a lot of people who are going to be coming to these exchanges have maybe a little bit more complicated lives. You know, they're self-employed or they are unevenly employed or, you know, their family status is changing and things change during the year. The trick to um, uh, qualifying for these subsidies in the individual market is that um, you have to make a pretty good guess because if you end up claiming subsidies for non-group coverage that you shouldn't have, you have to pay it back um, in April of 2015 when you file your taxes. So, um, and you can you know make adjustments during the year, but the stakes are kind of high. It's different than qualifying for the Medicaid Safety Net Program where you go in you know based on what your income is right this second and then you stay in for a period of time and then they reevaluate you based on what your income is this second and if you go out you go out but that's it there's no kind of look back or true up for what you should or shouldn't have been getting um, it's going to be a little more complicated in this market so people are going to need help um, 
Uh, surveys uh, indicate that um, as many as 80, 90 percent of the uninsured say they'd actually like somebody to sit down with them and help them on this. They'll be able to apply for coverage. Um, uh, the exchanges will all have an online application process. It's streamlined. It's supposed to be kind of interactive and kind of help you through the questions. Um, but, you know, some people will find it easier than others for a variety of reasons um, to go through this and they may want some help, particularly since the stakes are high and if you make a mistake, it could end up costing you some money. So, um, the exchanges are supposed to provide helpers, they're called navigators. Um, uh, in the federally operated exchanges, money's kind of tight in the federally operated exchanges. The expectation was that states um, would do all of this and the ACA appropriated unlimited money, um, as much sums as the states need, um, to build their exchanges. The 17 states that are building their own exchanges have already pulled down three to four billion dollars um, in this unlimited grant money to stand these things up and hire the navigators and so forth. Um, Congress only gave um, a, uh, the federal government one billion uh, to implement what they thought would be its part, which was just kind of some behind the scenes mechanics, and now they're going to have to run it everywhere. So the money that's available for navigators is going to be a little thin here in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. Um, one and a half million dollars um, has been apportioned for navigators in Pennsylvania, two million in New Jersey. Um, by contrast, the state of Arkansas um, has pulled down $17 million. Um, in Maryland, where I live, $25 million, just for navigators, and we don't have as many uninsured as you folks do. So, um, so the lines may be a little long <laughs> when people go to get help um, for these navigators. In terms of your own story ideas, um, uh, at some point, uh, the, who these folks are are going to be named. You'll be able to see them um, on a website. You should get to know them. Um, find out what it, how they're doing their job, what kinds of stuff are they seeing, what kinds of you know, help is being offered, where are people kind of uh, encountering difficulties, where are the navigators um, finding that they feel um, you know, equipped to do this and where could they use some more backup. The federal government's not going to have a lot of resources, at least at the outset, um, to back these guys up if they have hard questions. Um, you may also want to look when the federal government, right now they're running these exchanges a little bit on a shoestring, but money's going to start flowing in. All of the exchanges will be operating starting January 1 going forward um, based on an assessment on insurers in the state. So the floodgates are going to open up. Um, and we haven't heard yet, you know, when it is that the federal government's going to start, you know, spending more of this new operating revenue. Um, that might be an interesting question to ask. And then just the last thing in terms of ideas, um, uh, there can also be something called certified application counselors, which are basically just volunteer um, assisters. Um, the federal government will allow for that. They'll make some training available for that. Take the training. I'm going to do it. Um, I mean, get ready. You're going to need like a week or two um, in August to do it because it's probably like a 30-hour course. It's going to be online. But take it and be your ACA block captain and, you know, help some of your neighbors while you're at it and then kind of see, well, what's going on? You know, what are the kinds of issues that they're coming up against? What are the questions that they're having? How well is this working for them? How well is it working for them? So um, I guess I'll pause there and we'll do the rest in questions. Okay, so let's turn uh, over now to Jerry, who's going to talk to us about the challenges for hospitals. And I am guessing we may hear a very different about a very different story in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, based on one state moving forward with the Medicaid expansion. Right. You don't want to be a Medicaid, uh, an un uninsured, eligible for Medicaid in Pennsylvania. Um, because of the lack of expansion of the Medicaid program in Pennsylvania, there will be a million or more uninsured. Okay, that's the starting point. Um, hospitals, you know, have been through this dance before. Um, and I actually was part of this dance. I guess I'm the oldest person in the world. Um, in Washington, 1963, we were writing regulations for Medicare and Medicaid on the premise that it was going to be the forerunner of universal health care. Um, I then uh, had the opportunity of implementing it in a hospital in New York, you know, and that's when I lost my hair. Um, so hospitals have been kind of poised, <laughs> if you will, to be a player in 
taking care of the health care needs of the population in the United States. This time, it's for real, despite the 37 votes in the House. Um, come 2014, uh, it will be a fact. Now, hospitals, because they're very adaptive organizations, said we better figure out how to do this before 2014. So the ones who are going to be successful started really right away in looking at the change in the model. Right now, hospitals care about volume. <clears throat> We were talking earlier, when the flu season comes, <coughs> fill the beds, build the, build the insurers, and everybody's happy. Under this model, that is the wrong thing to happen. And so hospitals are trying to figure out how they're going to care for population groups, not individuals, and do it, um, meeting standards of quality, and getting paid enough to uh, produce a good product. There's a timing problem. With uh, the uh, implementation of the uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, what is called disproportionate share, which goes to hospitals that take care of the indigent, poor, uninsured, is going to go away. Uh, if that goes away, before all the people get covered by insurance, the hospitals are going to be in deep, deep trouble because the timing will be very poor for, for them. There's also a question about graduate medical education. Now, you all know we have a deficit of primary care physicians. 37 million more people coming into the healthcare system. Two don't work well together. And Congress has decided to limit the number of residents that they will fund out of Medicaid. So there's a, there are a lot of moving parts here. But the biggest one is probably adjusting what hospitals do, for whom they do it, in a new model. Because right now, it's volume and volume and volume. It's an interesting article in the Kaiser Health News. Uh, they looked at CEO compensation in hospitals, 12 hospitals. All of them were tied to volume, the bonuses, every single one. How do you flip that switch and say, no, no volume. Volume is not what we want. We want quality, quality products. In the process, hospitals are lowering their costs substantially. There are layoffs, some announced. Some secret, but there are layoffs in the workforce. And that has a profound impact on the economics of uh, the communities in which, in which they're located. Um, at the same time, hospitals now are very nervous about capital investment. So they've slowed the, the um, investment in new buildings. Uh, there's much more emphasis on retooling and readapting existing buildings because the exposure is enormous when you have 30 year bonds out there that you have to cover. Hospitals are now finally having to talk to physicians, to figure out how to work with them together in this new, in this new paradigm. And uh, that's a big leap forward culturally for, for most hospitals. Uh, physicians, in the meantime, are joining groups. They're becoming employees of groups, of hospitals. So the private practice model is on the way out. It's, a, it's an old model. People coming out of residency training don't want to do that, can't afford to do it. They're looking for employment. So it's a whole new ballgame. Pennsylvania, uh, People point to, well, give me a good model of what the future is going to look like. In Pennsylvania, it's Geisler. Now, people kind of disregard it because where is it? I don't even know where it is. But they have, they have built a model and demonstrated that you can take care of a population effectively with quality and lower the cost. Um, 
there aren't that many models like Geisinger around, but it's a model, and it's you know it, it's documented that that what they do works. So we're in the middle of a huge sea change with hospitals. Huge. Some of them have moved quickly in trying to figure out where their costs are, how to control them, what to do in terms of quality, how to get your arms around, around that, uh, and some think it's going to go away. So um, in, in, um, in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, I believe there are four independent community hospitals left, four, four hospitals. Every other hospital is part of a group, part of a corporation. So the days of the community hospital are really numbered. It's already started happening here. And with that goes the focus of the community hospital on its community. Its board are community people. The physicians tend to be community people. That is all being corporatized. And uh, that's just <coughs> happening and will happen. In, and we're going to wind up with very, very large corporations uh, dealing with health care. On that positive note, <laughs> let's, let's move over to Uva. Uh, I asked Uva to, to talk about uh, this concept of rate shock, uh, which we've been hearing so much about. Uh, once we have the insurance companies uh, coming out with their new plans and we see what the premiums are going to be like, are we going to be shocked by the, the, the premiums that we see? And um, he came back to me with a, a different term, rate joy. So he's going to talk to us about rate joy. Well, it's both. Uh, in fact, I just finished a little primer, about 1,200 words, on the primer on rate shock and rate joy in uh, healthcare. I do want to uh, quickly say I've uh, often been with you and admire you guys because uh, I view uh, reporters uh, really part of the health services research community. It starts with very basic research, then number crunching, and then policy analysis, and then somebody has to communicate that to people who can actually make decisions. And we wonks are not all that good at it, you are. <laughs> and I remember I came to Seattle, I think that's where I met you, end of the world, long, long trip, uh, where you had your meeting, and I was so impressed with the enthusiasm and dedication. Real patriots. So I, I, I admire you guys. So I'm very happy to be here. The other uh, quick point I want to make, when I listen to my colleagues, now I'm brain damaged. I, I grew up in Europe and then was a Canadian. And health, <laughs> health insurance is simple. You just say, I want it. And you're done. You have it. That's it. There's no form. There may be a little form. You better put your name down. But it's about it. So in spring recess, I always say my Canadian colleagues go skiing. I choose health insurance. And the interesting thing is, Americans have no idea how much they suffer and how much money they pay for choice for this thing that Americans want. But not choice of doctor and hospital, because you're often enslaved to a network. The Canadian would would be an uproar if they didn't have completely free choice of doctor and hospital. Choice of insurance. So one of the things you can tell me, what is it about choice of insurance carriers that you are willing to die for? Uh, I don't <laughs> Now the topic that was in the news in a couple of uh, last two weeks was the premiums on these exchanges. What will they be? And the, the, the kind of uh, things that come out, Krugman, I think, jumped the gun, declared victory, because California came in relatively low. I think it's premature, so people on the progressive side should cool it. My view is we will really know how this works at the end of 2014. That's when the, the first really good articles can be written. Everything till then is speculation. I just plowed through the tour de force of the Society of Actuaries. I don't recommend it, you know, what they think is graceful prose and something else for us. But I actually suffer through it. And when you're all done, probably a two, three million dollar piece of work, it's all speculation. You know? 
and very poorly rendered to the point that the uh, insurance department of Ohio com completely misused it, saying under Obamacare, premiums will go up uh, 88% in Ohio. Well, first of all, it wasn't about premiums, it was about uh, cost. The way actually pictorially to think about it, in the market that Karen this, uh, described, and she's a, a living expert on it, I heard her testify, the individual market that we now have, you have medical underwriting, which means you fill in this huge questionnaire and all the drugs you're taking so they can infer what you have from the drugs. And then you get uh, rated on your personal own health status to the point that many times you couldn't afford the premium even if they'll accept you. But they, in uh, Indiana, for example, for people uh, 50 to 59, they reject 24%. And they have a long list. It's really worth looking at. I think Jonathan Cohen dug that out. A long list of conditions and drugs that are flagged to them to reject you. So that's the market, and you've testified quite uh, extensively on that. So you, from, if you had an axis here, the premium, and here, health status, healthy to sick, from your perspective, that curve will sort of go up and get very steep. And what the, the Obamacare does, it draws a line through it and say everyone pays the same rate which mathematically has to mean that some younger, healthier people will pay more uh, than they used to, and some sick people who were rejected, couldn't afford it, or had to pay sky high premiums, will get lower. Hardly anyone ever talks about that so many people will get lower premiums, and that's what I call premium joy. I don't know why the White House didn't use it, Well, the White House doesn't. Is, gets a, a sort of C minus for communication in my view. Uh, they have not done as good a job on this as they should. Because there will be some premium shock. But then again, these premiums that are now going up for the younger people, they'll be mitigated by subsidies. A lot of the people who are young and uninsured are low income people. So if you look at the subsidies, they're getting towards the premium and towards cost sharing the net out-of-pocket of them may not be so shocking. And to actually describe that is very difficult. And how this will really play out in every state is not at the moment, you can pay someone three million to run the numbers, but you wouldn't bet on them. And they themselves, the actuary says, you know, don't sort of make decisions on it. It's the best we can do. But that's basically where we're at. And so how does then, this kind of information get misused. Suppose you are a staunch opponent of Obamacare for ideological reasons. You just hate him, period. What would you say? Well, I would now compare what you can get on e-health insurance, which is an electronic exchange that's about 20 years old already, I think, or at least 10. You put in for a male, not women, because <coughs> women have babies, they're expensive. So you put a male in there who's perfectly healthy, <laughs> right? A young 28-year-old. And then you find the premium for the skimpiest, crappiest policy you could imagine. But it's called, quote, insurance. And you compare that with the California exchange premium or wherever else they have. And then, of course, you could say, oh my god, premiums go up 300%. Who does that? The Wall Street Journal editorialist, not the reporters, but editorialist, uh, <clears throat> does it. The right wing economist do it. As, uh, my colleague at Stanford, Dan Kessler, did it for Kaiser. Is, uh, he compared the Kaiser rate, but clearly for a healthy person, with the Kaiser rate that they just bid, which is community rated, which is averaged over everyone. So I think you really uh, have to smell a rat every time. You see that and say, well, who benefits? It's a major redistribution of income, if you want. Some people will lose, and you should be honest about that, but quite a few people uh, will gain. And then overall, we all pay in what it's now for the next 10 years, 1.4 trillion, Karen? Where are we? Something in that neighborhood. 
of federal subsidies that will help people buy this, uh, this insurance. The pools are just not comparable. The, the traditional pool will have in it young people or people who could afford the premium, but it'll exclude sicker people who couldn't afford the premium and the people who were rejected and the people who are in high risk pools. That's all not in the pool now. Once this is run in at the end of 2014, all of these people will be in the pool. So if I then ask, as the actuaries did, what is the average cost per person in the pool? Of course, that pool's average cost, cost for healthcare will be higher. Why? Because all the rejects are in it, all the sick people are in it, all the high-risk people are in it. Right? But these average costs, and that's what Ohio was uh, propagating there, they are not the premium, because the premium is net of the subsidy. So it's a very complicated story, and I, I'm sorry, I, I, I spent two and a half days writing a 1,200-word uh, <coughs> blog post to try to get this across. And I don't know if I succeeded. Fortunately, I have an editor who converts it to English. But uh, uh, you, you really do have to dig, but you should watch out for the ideologues that are out there. This is an insurgency war. You, it, it's, I, our son served in Afghanistan. It's the first time I understood US health policy. It is a kind of insurgency war where everything is fair game. And I'm very sad about some of my colleagues with PhDs <coughs> in economics who nevertheless, for reason, ideological reasons, slammed the news rather than telling you the whole picture. Yes, some people will pay more and they will be losers and some people will be gamers. The one uh, that I, had, I, I close on that is how would I justify that to young people? Because the Swiss do this, the Germans do it, the Dutch do it, they do it in Taiwan. How do young people accept community rates? Think of it as a stock option. A stock option, you pay now a price, you get a piece of paper that says, you can buy this share of Alcoa for 50 bucks within the next two years. Alcoa stock rises to 90, you have the right to buy it at 50. A community rated premium is like <coughs> an option on a health insurance policy. So when you are sick, rather than having to pay your actuarial cost based on your health status, you get it at average cost, which is maybe a third of that. So it's really a call option on a low cost premium for the days when you are sick. And Europeans at least think that could happen to me. Number one, they believe they grow old. Americans believe mm -hmm. thermonuclear war is around the corner, <laughs> so I'll never grow old. <laughs> yeah, you know you grow old, and secondly, you, you're only temporarily healthy. Every healthy person is only temporarily healthy. And, and, and that's how I would have, if I had been Obama, uh, sold it uh, to young people to say, you're going to get yours when you get older. There's a young person. He's nodding. <laughs> I hope you bought it. <laughs> Okay, Carl Stark, your best advice for reporters and some politics, please. Yeah, I, I um, well, first of all, I got to say, um, you know, thanks for the compliment about what reporters do. I, I, according to the most recent survey, something like 40% of Americans don't even know that Obamacare is the law, and 12% of people think it's been repealed. Um, so we kind of got a big hill to climb up, folks. Um, I, I wanted to respond to some of the ideas that were said here about. Um, just some, I'm going to talk about story ideas, um, and I'm going to talk about some other things too. Um, I love Karen's idea about um, taking, you know, a reporter tape becoming a navigator and, and just writing about it. First of all, you become really expert in the in the field, and it's going to be it's going to be wild because you get 30 hours right of class, and then you take a federal test. And, and, and then you're lo let loose upon the populace. Um, and I don't know, it just sounds like to me, it's, I mean, it's a very complicated law. You just heard this, all these descriptions and I just doubt, I wonder how 30 hours could do it and I, I'd like to experience that. Um, yeah, there, and, and, and I really like Jerry's point about, you know, if dish money goes away and there's no Medicaid expansion in Pennsylvania, um, that's a real problem. And also the idea that the days of the community hospital are numbered 
um, I think that's kind of, kind of interesting for us and something we can, we can follow up on. Um, Uwe's point is, is about the insurance premiums is, is really um, an important one. I guess an insurgency war is what you called it. Um, clearly, the insurance premiums are a big story, right? I mean, so far, and by my count, about 10 states have put out their, their numbers. Um, and he mentioned California, which came out very positive, and then, and then Ohio, which came out very negative. And it was very, it was very um, interesting the way they, they, they cut it. But um, I think, I think the, prob the problem is, is that, as, as, as our previous speakers have said, and know better than I, the current market is so dysfunctional. And so you're just comparing a really well person in the current market to somebody in a real plan in the, in, in, you know, in the future. And so that's why it's very hard to compare what's there now to what's going to be, because there's just so many more rules, there's so many, there's so many more um, protections built in. That, that I think I think reporters really need to be aware of the spin. I mean, I think one of the things we could do is do like a scare of the week, you know, like like one horror story a week and just and just parse it out. I mean, they're all. I mean, the famous example is is Sarah Palin, you know, about the death panels on Medicare, which nobody's ever really quite located. Um, and I would love to I would love to find one. But they, they they happen all the time. Michelle Michelle Bachman said that. I mean, the newest thing is to kind of uh, sort of put the. Um, the IRS, um, the whole scandal, the IRS over, you know, they have a piece of the Affordable Care Act, right? They're going to be collecting the tax, the, the, the tax credits, and, and so now the, the, the current thing is to say that the, that the, the IRS is going to be in charge of American health care, and um, the, we're going to give the IRS, Obamacare is going to give the IRS the most personal, sensitive, intimate, private health care information. I mean, it's all just... You know, that's the kind of thing, you know, check it out, make sure, I think there's gonna be a lot of stuff happening as this thing gets to crunch time, and it would be fun to just keep a list of the scare of the week. Um, okay, you asked me to talk a little bit about politics. Um, we have really interesting comparison of governors in this area. I mean, we have both Republican governors. Um, you know, Corbett has really cut the safety net to a remarkable degree. He's cut adult basic. He's cut, you know, 12, like something like 90,000 kids off of Medicaid. He's gotten rid of general assistance. He's gotten rid of, um, and he's not going to do the expansion. Whereas, whereas, um, you know, uh, Christie, thank you, is is really going great guns. He's added 25,000 kids to his Medicare program. His Medicare program has grown so much. He's gotten a 52 million dollar performance bonus from from Medicaid, um, and it's just a kind of fascinating the, the way he's uh, he's completely. Um, you know, he's completely navigated it differently. Um, so I think there's really a tale of two governors, and it really raises the question that our panelists have risen, uh, have risen already about what happens to the uninsured in, in Pennsylvania. Um, I think the, um, another, big, another big thing is how businesses are gonna react to this, okay? That's, that's gonna be really interesting, because if you're a business, as I understand it, of over 50 employees, you know, you pretty much have to participate, and you have to, you have to basically protect your, your workers. And, and just some of the things that have come up in, 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 my, little, in my little searches um, is, for example, temp agencies now are going around selling themselves as Obama solution, solution providers. And they're, they're basically going to ask companies to outsource Obamacare to these temp agencies. And they're going to take care of all their, all their requirements. It's kind of fascinating um, to see if that, if that in, indeed plays out. Um, there are already reports of, um, of employers cutting um, at the hours of their employees to less than 30 hours a week so they don't trigger the law. There are community colleges apparently doing that. Um, there's one interesting development is this whole self-insurance thing, which, okay, so companies self-insure, they pretty much take the risk on, they, they, they put some money aside for insurance and they, they, um, they use an insurance company to handle the claims. And, and now apparently the companies are being urged to self-insure and what that does is it completely skips all of Obamacare, and it skips all the rules. And there's some, there's some. Um, I think, I think um, they, they need reinsurance. They, they, but apparently this reinsurance is going down to smaller and smaller companies. I'm sort of intrigued by that as a, as a possible trend, um, and and a way to avoid Obamacare's rules and taxes. Um, there are some creative things going on. Um, one thing to look out for in our area is whether there's going to be these so-called narrow, narrower networks of doctors and hospitals. And the idea is that you basically put together a smaller network of cheaper docs and cheaper hospitals, and you basically save money. And, 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 and Uwe mentioned how Americans love choice and traditionally have hated this option. Um, but if it saves money and you, know, you're in, you're, you're, you don't have insurance the other way, it might be a really good, good way. Um, there are a million sort of patient stories in this law. Um, I think smokers is an interesting one. You know, smokers, um, they, they, the law gives the ability to the insurance company to raise smokers' health insurance by, by uh, 
And apparently if the smokers actually show that they're in remission or they actually try to quit, they can actually escape that. But what happens to smokers I think would be <clears throat> a cool story. Finally, one last idea I just want to close on is the Affordable Care Act um, requires you know, hospitals to charge reasonable rates to the uninsured. Um, and it's a little unclear what reasonable rates are, but in the past, uh, they got in trouble, hospitals got in trouble because they charged their expensive, char their, their charges really to the uninsured, <laughs> the most expensive costs were put on the uninsured. And the law prevents that. And I guess my challenge to you is, okay, what's really going on out there? So are hospitals you know, charging uninsured people less as they're supposed to? Or are they going after them with high charges and are they then dunning them? That would be a really interesting thing to know. Okay, on this very point, particularly for New Jersey uh, report, can, we, uh, we had this commission and I, I won't bore you with the story, but I, I persuaded the governor to pass a law that they cannot charge an uninsured person more than Medicare plus 15%. And uh, I just said Medicare, but uh, then negotiated, okay. That means with Medicare plus 15, you know that their costs are covered. You know that for sure. And that's the law in New Jersey. I did feed that into Max Bacchus' shop. Uh, it would be so easy to put that into the Affordable Care Act, right? Because then you know what it is. Because I saw that too, we can't charge more than what's reasonable. Well, that's a lawyer's dream. Right? <laughs> uh, I don't know why I didn't have the guts simply to say Medicare are well thought out bundled payments for hospitals. They're already bundled. You see, the thing we want to do. And then all you have to do is add 15% to make sure that they can cover their costs, uh, etc. And apparently in New Jersey, that, but it would be interesting for New Jersey reporters to check, is that actually being obeyed in the law? Or are there hospitals that weasel out of that? Uh, because, uh, you know, Corzine is gone and, and he sort of turned his back on the whole thing anyhow. But I think it's an interesting question and that has to, at some point, be done nationally. So you saw, uh, who was it, the bitter pill, Stephen Brill's piece. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that, that is just scandalous and uh, in New Jersey that's not possible. That's a good story. Okay, so let's open it up for questions. We have a room full of reporters. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. Yes, right here. Uh, thank you guys so much for all your insights. My question's for Dr. Katz. Um, just on this topic of hospital reimbursement, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what um, the changes are in the ACA that are incenting hospitals to move towards population um, focus rather than volume. Fear. <laughs> so the incentives in the ACA that are like what exactly is forcing them, and also, am I understanding correctly that other than New Jersey, other states don't um, have any rule for now these new people um, being charged different prices from the Medicaid um, average? Is it a total like you know free for all? Yeah. Uh, you know what's interesting? I, I never realized how many states don't have insurance commissioners. Rates don't go before anybody. It's approved by the by the legislature. Um, but back to your question, um, hospitals are very adaptive. If you believe that this brave new world is going to happen, you make big changes in terms of how you organize and deliver care in the hospital. You have to understand your business in ways they don't understand now. And if you ask the hospital, well, Medicare plus 15%, would that cover it? And don't have a clue. Don't have a clue um, whether that's, you know, works for the provider, works for the, for the patient, but I don't know if it works for the provider. So there's a whole huge learning curve that lies ahead for hospitals. Some are, you know, moving down that road and others, well, frankly, aren't. And uh, so there'll be a lot of casualties in the, in the hospital world. But one thing for sure, as patient, as people, we're, we're gonna be dealing with big corporations. And, you know, the good and the bad that, that goes with that. Um, we have a couple of big systems in the Philadelphia area. They're gonna join forces. So we're talking about mega corporations 
in charge of population health care. Now, how far removed is that from the, you know, the notion that all health care is local? That goes away. It literally goes away. It will be formulaic, the part because it has to be, and it will be very impersonal. So, you know, um, the costs are coming down. Hospitals are cutting costs. Reimbursement is cut to hospitals is being reduced. So there's a whole landslide of cost reduction. Hospitals have to figure out how to pro provide quality products with less resources. So, I don't know, does that answer your question? I just um, don't understand why volume still would be a way for them to make more money. So why is volume, volume is still a way to make more money? Yeah, volume is really a death trap. Because they're not going to get paid on volume, they're going to get paid on an insured population, keeping them healthy, keep, keeping them out of the hospital, keeping them away from CAT scans and MRIs and you know that whole that whole, whole life. The incentives are just totally reversed. You know, in many ways, we hear about um, uh, hospital systems and and providers having their having one foot in each of two canoes. Uh, they still have uh, uh, one foot in the fee-for-service canoe where they still have a lot of their business in fee-for-service where they have to do volume business, but yet they have another foot in the uh, canoe where they have to move to this world of bundled payments and paying for um, uh, uh, outcomes and, and performance. So, uh, you know, I'd be interested in hearing some of our speakers uh, talk about how our providers are supposed to handle this new world where actually they're supposed to be moving to this, but yet they do have one foot in each canoe, and anybody who's been in a canoe knows that that's no easy thing to do. Um, anybody else? Karen, Uva? Well, I guess there's sort of two sort of two basic things in the Affordable Care Act. One is in the Medicare world, which is almost half, right, of hospital revenue on average. Um, there are these sort of new payment um, programs called accountable care organizations. I don't know if you've heard about those, but the notion is that the hospitals will get together with the doctors that they work with who admit to them, who, you know, um, doctors in the community, and they'll, um, they will talk to each other, um, as Jerry said, and, and even cooperate and think about um, um, the, the Right now, uh, the notion is if doctors do a better job of preventing care and keep people out of the hospitals, well, the hospitals lose money, right? And the doctors get more treatment. So the notion is to kind of get everybody into an organization and then pool some money, and then Medicare has some incentives. So to the extent that you all, in doing this, save us, the program, some money, we'll share some of those savings back with you. So that's kind of the direct push. And I only know a little bit about accountable care organizations from listening to Don Berwick talk about them, but it sounds really good. Um, and then the indirect push is what's going on in the private insurance market, where we're sort of, you know, waving our hands and saying insurance companies will figure out how to do this, because um, so far they haven't, but maybe they will, um, because now insurance companies can't compete um, based on uh, making a profit just on you know cherry picking off the healthy people. They have to take everybody in these exchanges at least. With, now again, this is a little bit of the tail wagging the dog because most of us are outside in group health plans, but in the exchanges where there will be more people now, um, the subsidies are tied to the second lowest cost of the plan. Ask me why, I'll tell you later. But you know, but the, the idea is you know, to try to compete to make your silver plan kind of you know, one of the better looking prices um, in the exchange. And because the subsidies will be based on that. Um, and uh, you can take your subsidy and you can spend it on a more expensive plan, but it won't go as far. You'll have to add in more of your own money. So, so there's this new incentive now for plans to kind of, you know, for insurers to kind of drive their costs down. Well, how are they going to do that? Well, they can be a little more efficient. Maybe their CEOs don't have to make as much. They don't have to pay agents as much. They're marketing a little more efficient. But at the end of the day, you know, healthcare costs are going up even in the Medicare program, which is very efficient. So they're supposed to just kind of magically find a way to do this. How are they gonna do it? Who the heck knows? These, um, these narrower networks is one notion that somehow they'll go back to the hospitals in the community and say, I'm not gonna put all of you in my network anymore. I'm only gonna pick two of you. 
And so you all are going to have to bid for a better price. So far, insurers haven't done a very good job of doing that because the hospitals have said, you know, no one's going to want to be in your plan if they can't come to my when they get sick. So there's been kind of a standoff um, between the hospitals in particular um, and the insurers. And there's a question about whether, you know, that will change, whether the kind of bargaining tools will go in that direction or whether they'll do other things. Um, I'm not so sure we're going to see a ton of that. Maybe we will. Um, but I think um, the tiering of networks is going to get a lot more complicated in hospitals. So everybody's going to be in network, but some are going to be more favored than others. So every hospital, you can go to any hospital you want in town if you're in this, you know, United plan. But if you go to this hospital, you know, your copay will be $50. If you go to this hospital, it'll be 50%. If you go, um, and how are you supposed to know this? <laughs> Particularly if the ambulance takes you there, right? So, so um, I, I think there will be a lot of moving parts in plans. Um, and um, I always worry a little bit as a consumer advocate when it starts to get a little more complicated inside because you know, shoot, I've been doing this my whole career and I still, when somebody in my family gets sick, I just like spread it all out on the dining room table and make my spreadsheets and try, you know, like figure it all out and it gives me a giant headache. So, um, so I think this is a very difficult thing for consumers to do and we'll have to kind of see when plans, when insurers start doing this competing, how transparent is it um, and how much does it kind of just shift the burden um, uh, to their uh, insured people to somehow figure out, you know, don't go to the cardiologist because none of the cardiologists are on the favorite tier. And oh, I'm sorry, you had a heart attack. That's just the way it goes. So, uh, you know, so I, I think we're, we're uh, as Uva said, a lot of this is going to be moving and we're going to have to see what these new plans look like. In Massachusetts, which is a couple years ahead of us, um, we're seeing lots of tiered networks. Tiered networks is like all over Massachusetts now. So, um, you know, there's in network and then there's really in network. So, um, and that, that does get um, a little harder, I think, for consumers to navigate when they're sick. Yeah, I mean, to answer your question very simply is we, we sort of, here's the dream. What hospitals do can be classified into episodic care, something that begins and ends, like a normal delivery or coronary bypass, and then chronic care, where multiple diseases, it never ends or starts, it's just there. And so for the episodic, uh, you would have a bundled payment, one payment for the whole thing. And for the chronic care management, you would have a capitation per year per person. That's the dream. I think that dream, to realize it, would take at least half a decade. I'm thinking a decade. In the meantime, fee-for-service will rule 80% uh, for at least five years. So even the ACOs uh, now that are out of the pioneer, it's still fee-for-service based, it's shared saving, but it is fee-for-service. The private insurance plans are also experimenting with bundles. Everyone is, but it's sort of a little bit like the Wright brothers. Yes, there was a thing that flew, but it isn't really an Airbus. So uh, that'll take time. Population-based research, that is sort of a, a dream. It's at least 40 years old, uh, but it'll never happen in America. And the reason it can't happen is we want choice. To be, really have population health, uh, and be accountable for it. Somebody would have to be permanently within. Kaiser could do that, mainly because people love Kaiser. But Americans want to be able to choose a different kind of uh, big mega uh, health system every year. And then how can you be held accountable for something those guys didn't do the last year? So population health is an American dream that'll never happen, in my view. Yes. Uh, my name is Kanani. I'm a medical resident um, at Jefferson in Pediatrics and at DuPont Children's Hospital. I have two questions. One is uh, pertains to what you've been talking about as far as incentives. Um, I'm going into primary care, so I'm for non um, non repayment or, or not for emphasis on on um, on procedures. So I'm very happy to hear that. On the other hand, if I'm being paid based on my patient population improving then I'm going to be inclined to go and move to a healthier patient population, one that's compliant, one that understands directions, educated, 
So my first question is, what are we doing as far as um, this bill or future bills um, to uh, allow for doctors to um, have patient populations that are um, that are less informed and, and more troubled. And the second question is, as a resident, I'm finding that the burden of healthcare for my population is increasingly falling on myself and my co-residents. As you're saying, as um, attendings are laid off and more of the um, admissions come to me. Uh, for instance, neurology. I have not studied neurology except in med school. Um, I'm not trained in it. I'm not a specialist, and yet I'm managing neurology patients with some oversight by an attending, but sometimes I never even um, work with that attending in person by phone. So when we talk about residents um, being limited, um, looking forward, how are we going to train next generation's healthcare providers? Because this is increasingly a problem. Um, do you have another hard question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I do. First of all, I think what will happen with the uh, uh, the cohort of patients, of people, patients who are sick, who are um, ill-equipped to deal with uh, you know life in America, uh, they they will wind up being cared for in hospitals with with employed physicians in hospitals. In private practice, it will be impossible to to be able to effectively deal with this, those, that population. Unfortunately, but that's, that's true. You know, medical education needs a flexible report, you know, because, you know, the way it's structured now is like 50 years out of date. Forget the technical part of it, it's, it's the care of, of patients in 2014. It's very different than what you're being trained to do, right? I mean, Based in a hospital is the wrong place <laughs> to be training pediatric residents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but a curious thing is that more and more physicians in private practice are number one, not accepting any insurance. Number two, you want to see them, you can pay them a concierge fee, and they will be yours for 24 hours, seven days a week. You're right. Um, the other is 55 and over. I don't want to deal with this. I'll retire. It's just do not want it. So we're going to lose a whole population of physicians who it's beyond them. They're not about to make this profound change in the way they practice medicine. So, but, you know, on the physicians, side, a lot of dynamics going on and should be going on. So you're in for a good time. Well, so I, I actually have a follow-up question to that. Are we in, especially with expansion um, uh, of insurance, are we in for a workforce shortage? Are we in for a shortage of physicians um, in either Pennsylvania or New Jersey or both, especially given the aging of the population? And uh, what are we dealing with in terms of scope of practice laws in both of these states? Um, uh, what I'm talking about is, are we going to be seeing nurses practicing and filling in more for primary care physicians if there's going to be a lack of primary care physicians in these states? Right. And it, that, that is the great white hope, frankly. Uh, nurses what, what have the answer is to license advanced nurse practitioners to do more than they're doing now uh, with and without super direct supervision by physicians. They have been proven to be the best providers for chronic illness, which is forever. It's, um, it's actually happening now. I'm working it, in, it in the delivery room at Christiana, and I'm being taught by nurse practitioners. Yeah, and right. Now, now nurse practitioners are not cheap. They don't take coal. I mean, so the issue is around that. But from the standpoint of effectively caring for a, a patient population that is chronically ill, whether they're kids or adults, they have proven to be worth every penny and they do a great job uh, and relieving physicians to really deal with, you know, the more complicated uh, uh, illnesses. 
Yes. The price of brown health care is at best for me. Is there one segment that might... Pr pricing is what? <coughs> Opaque. A Pricing is opaque. It's a mystery. a mystery. Unlike almost anything else we've got. Is there one segment of healthcare that might lead the a better change or change for the better? Well, uh, I think it'll have to come because I see the insurance industry moving to, I think Karen mentioned it already, reference pricing, which is basically a very gentle or not so gentle form of rationing healthcare by income class, where you, the insurer will tell you or your company you work for, if you have your baby in this low cost hospital or see these low cost physicians, will pay 90% of the fee. But if you go somewhere else, you pay the whole difference between what we would give you. If to operate that system, which of course economists, particularly on the right, have been dreaming about for a long time, to operate that system, you need prices. <coughs> Otherwise, this system cannot work. So I think they'll be coming. I think the opaque, the opacity, is that the right English? Uh, it's the last hurrah. I think it started uh, even before Stephen Brill. There have been quite a few newspaper stories. And CMS, although these charges are basically useless, nevertheless unleashing those spreadsheets and you've probably written about them. There's a new one now for outpatient, mm -hmm. right? These are giant spreadsheets. Unleashing that information, I think, was just the first salvo in this thing. I don't think it's stoppable. Eventually, we will have prices. But that'll also, I think, take maybe five years. Because one of the problems is you have to sort of aggregate what hospitals do into manageable pieces. The charge master of a hospital has 20,000 items in it. So that information will be completely useless to patients. So it has to be aggregated in some way. And we haven't figured out a common nomenclature on which we could compare. So I say the research for that would take five years alone. But that will come. I think the. But again, I got a, from a famous reporter who you all know, her daughter is uninsured and expecting a baby. And they were phoning around. She has a, a midwife, can't afford a doctor. The midwife was calling New Jersey hospitals for the charge for a normal delivery. One gave it, the other one didn't. I tried this myself. You know, we always pretend to be immigrants, entrepreneurs, making <laughs> <laughs> with a little accent, you know. Princeton Hospital wouldn't give me a price for a colonoscopy or my wife for a, a normal delivery. Just refused. So that, I think, will be done away with much sooner. But you know who else won't tell you? Blue Cross, United, right? So there's, there's a lot of prices. <laughs> there's a lot of prices on all the different charge masters, and then there's a lot of prices that the insurance companies will say is reasonable, and they'll reimburse based on that. And phrases, but nobody pays that rate. Right, well, yes, but they won't tell you the rate that they do pay. Um, and, and that's going to be the thing that drives it. If, you know, eventually, if we get everybody covered, then no one will be paying retail anymore, right? So we'll all be then paying whatever, you know, 20% of whatever our insurance company says is reasonable. But what is that number? I mean, hmm. So um, there's authority in the Affordable Care Act. This is knowable. Um, and there's, a there's authority in the Affordable Care Act to make everybody tell and make it public, and that has not been implemented yet. Because um, as you might imagine, there was a little bit of pushback, and they had a whole lot of other things that were getting a little bit of pushback, so they kind of shoved that off to whenever. Um, but there's authority for that. The effective date was in 2010. So it's already a couple of years behind schedule. Um, and uh, just to put in a little plug for my own state of Maryland, um, when you look in that release of hospital data that came out from CMS, you know, and the, oh, $50,000 charge, you know, 8,000 was reasonable, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Scroll into the Maryland hospitals. Charge allowed, same, for everybody. And that's true for Medicare, that's true for private insurance, that's true for uninsured people, that's true for self-funded, you know, corporate plans. <coughs> 
Because you have an all payer system. We have an all payer system, yeah. and so you can just see it. And I, when we first moved to Maryland, and somebody was hospitalized, and I'm, I've always been used to seeing, you know, a charge versus allowed. And in Maryland, it was the same thing. Like, are my glasses? Am I seeing double? And it's like, no, it's the same number. So, I, and the hospitals like it. They actually like it because they define? know that they're going to get paid. Sure. So, how do you define all payer system? The state negotiates, not every hospital gets paid the same because they negotiate based on their costs. You know, Hopkins gets paid a little more because they're a teaching hospital, and Holy Cross in my neighborhood, which sees a lot of indigent care patients, gets kind of a plus up for that. So they all kind of negotiate with a single state commission, and they say, this is, this is what we're going to agree to be paid. And then everybody pays it then. Medicare pays it too. There's a waiver. Medicaid pays it. There ain't no cost shifting right. in Maryland. Yes, let's go here and then we'll come here. Uh, okay, back to the, the medical uh, labor force uh, issue. When, when the act was being drafted, uh, there, there was a provision uh, in the Affordable Care Act for to for increased funding for medical education, um, for uh, creating incentives for uh, for mm -hmm. students to go into public health uh, and to into uh, underserved areas. What's happening with that funding? Are hospitals or you know, medical schools or is any is any provision being made to kind of ramp up um, and bring more workers into the field? Uh, to meet this an anticipated increase in demand. Well, if, if you look at Philadelphia as an example, I believe um, it's the third, healthcare is the third largest employer. And um, if you look at the national numbers every year, uh, every month rather, um, the um, employment rate is, is f fueled by healthcare. But the, what's happening is that there's a, a gradation of employees being laid off and new employees being hired. Um, and in terms of uh, the primary care residencies, uh, I would say the specialists got a hold of that and choked it to death. So that, uh, because that was money coming out of their training program. So, um, you know, they kind of win the day. So it's unfortunate because they're just, I mean, the shortage of primary care physicians uh, all by itself are in, in the hundreds of thousands. And here we're dumping 37 million people, you know, with now free access to the healthcare system with no primary care base. It's a real problem. So where are these, where are people going to get there? If there is a shortage of primary care physicians, where are people going to get their care? Are there new settings? Are we talking about community health centers? Are we talking about minute clinics? Where are people going to be getting their care? Right. I think they'll just be more productive. The interesting thing is when you go across the United States and look at the physician population ratio, I think it varies by more than two by more than a factor of two. And it's been like that for 50 years. In fact, I did my thesis on, on looking at that to say, you know, how is it that in some states they have half the docs that they have in Massachusetts or, or other places? And I think what I found is where doctors are in shortage, they organize their practice differently. They use more support staff and so on. And I think you will have the CVS or Walmart clinics that would be very efficiently organized. I think most of us who sort of grew up uh, <clears throat> studying uh, the workforce issues said to have a physician supply that's a little tight is actually a good thing. The worst thing you want is a surplus of physicians. A, they find stuff to do that they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> and secondly, it's very expensive, right? So it's, it's actually better when they're a little bit too busy. And then, of course, I've been, for in my entire professional life, a strong supporter of the idea that nurses should be able to compete as independent practitioners with doctors, not under their supervision, hanging out the shingle, as long as they're honest about their degrees. That's actually a Milton Friedman idea. Goes back, capitalism and freedom, where he says licensing should be abolished. You cannot call yourself an MD unless you 
have an MD. But if you have RN or, uh, and you want to compete right next to a doctor's office, an economist believe that should be allowed. Uh, as long as patients know that. Now, what they can prescribe, you might circumscribe a little bit, but I think uh, they should have incredible freedom to prescribe medicines. Probably, they will study them more carefully than doctors do. Okay, question here. Um, New Jersey had a, a bill last week that the, uh, the legislature was advancing a bill that would require the state government to apply to the federal government for funding to create an all payer database. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the state, there was actually a deadline yesterday and the state government decided not to do it. And but the, the reason that the insurance companies gave for opposing or the yeah, the insurance companies gave for opposing the bill and the state government gave for not doing it was uh, that it would be sort of costly to administer and to gather the information and run it. And I'm wondering if you had any thoughts about whether there was other reasons why maybe conservatives would oppose it, or if it, have you heard of other reasons why for opposing uh, creating an alternative? Well, a number of states have these already, so and, and I think they all want them, so <laughs> it'll probably happen down the New road. New Jersey had it, yeah. and you had they one? called in yeah. the good old days, the hospitals. So, first of all, this lets who's ever running the database and whoever has access to it see the array of prices, but it lets you see a lot of other things, too, right? It lets you see sort of uh, utilization patterns and what else is going on and who's you know how many people are making claims for their mammograms in this plan versus in that plan so it, it gives you very kind of rich information it's not just the prices um, so I'm not quite sure what the politics were in New Jersey this time around but a lot of states have these and they've been building them for years so I think it'll come eventually I would hazard a guess do you have more to say that? well I, I remember I had the paper in Health Affairs saying this is nuts what we have out there, where I called up to get this law written. I initially wanted to peg uh, the maximum you can charge uninsured people on what the average uh, is in the private sector among private insurers. So I called my friend at Blue Cross and said, what do you pay for a colonoscopy? And he said, that's an idiotic question. I pay 50 different prices. I say, make me a table. And the, I think it varies by a factor of five. He says, I will pay a different price for a colonoscopy to the same hospital, depending on the plan, whether it's HMO or PPO, et cetera. So this nonsense of price discrimination that we have, with the smallest, <laughs> weakest payers pay the highest, and the big ones get low, the insurance companies like that. Because when you're big, you can get good rates. Small insurers don't, you know, walk in self-pay patients, pay the highest. I think at some point Americans will get fed up with this because it's unfair. These price differences are not related to cost or quality or patient satisfaction or anything. It's just simply what you can grab. And I think it'll go, and I bet you at some point New Jersey will have it. Because <coughs> when, when I uh, chaired that commission, the hospital said in the old days we could budget, we, could, we knew what was coming, uh, our prices weren't always up in the air, and they actually called it the good old days, and as I said, this is great. Why are Republicans against it? It looks to them like regulation, which of course it is. In Maryland, it is regulatory sure. to do this. And uh, then some insurers are against it because they think they could get a better deal. Every insurer thinks I could get a better deal on my own. In fact, I don't think that often do. Anybody else who has not asked a question? Okay, let's start here. Uh, this is more on a philosophical note, uh, but considering the huge chunk of healthcare dollars we spend on end-of-life care and critically ill patients with extremely few outcomes, or at the best can be described as average, now you have this insurgence of new, a new pool of uninsured patients being added on with a huge chronic disease burden, um, a lot of it has to do with the cultural approach to end-of-life issues in America and the medicalization of death. Now, do you think this is going to kind of force a paradigm shift in how we approach these issues, or is it just going to implode on itself? If we keep practicing it the same way, and it's the elephant in the room, we keep adding more patients. As a physician, it is 
It doesn't make sense. So do we change how we handle end of life care? Change? Because we are going to be pushing <coughs> more of this. You know, you practice the same care, you know, intubate and ventilate 90 year old patients, add 37 million more patients. Yeah. How but, do you But I would ask you, who makes those decisions? Uh, I think when you put in that situation, family. you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah, family. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a huge problem and it's, there are more layers than just the cultural part of it. Sure. There's, you know, there's sure. many layers to this. But where do you see that in a country where dying is an option? You know, end of life care is a medical problem where sometimes it doesn't have to be. You know, there's a big difference in how it's practiced in America versus many other countries. So, does end of life care change in our new evolving system? Well, you, you would have to begin by changing the tort laws because they are the families, very often it is the families. I think, are you a physician? Uh, our daughter was a resident and she said, you know, all night she was with the family, keep doing more, keep doing more, till at one moment she took him into the ICU and said, that's what I'm doing, do you want me to go on? And then they said, no. But, so you have that, but then there's also the tort laws. I remember Kaiser getting sued once with a huge settlement over uh, simply not doing heroic medicine on a hopeless case. So you, you would that, uh, so it's a cultural uh, shift. We Americans are really finicky about it because physician-assisted suicide here is an absolutely taboo topic, which uh, when you go to Belgium, uh, you saw that just the other day in the papers, or in the Netherlands, that is allowed. I find it personally ironic because unlike Europeans who view healthcare as a service, sort of basically a community service, we view it as a private consumption good. Patients are no longer called patients, they're consumers, and so on. And so here the state tells a person who wants to basically end this life, you must continue consuming what you don't want to consume and spend your own estate on it. And that in a state that couldn't have the mandate to be insured in a country. So I find this, can you see why after 40 years, I still don't understand America. <laughs> <laughs> this is very confusing. So let's, let's take this one, one last question here and then we're gonna wrap up. I'm just curious, do you, do you guys <coughs> believe that in some meaningful long, broad way, ACOs are going to are ACOs going to work? Gonna, but not, you know, not just like a handful, like not the Cleveland clinics of the world. I mean, are we going to see broad spread, not only accepted <coughs> doctors, but successes of this model? Um, and failures. And failures. And both, you're saying? Both, yeah. Um, and, and, the diff and the differences between them will be very apparent. Um, and that's a good thing. Because, you know, as I said earlier, many hospitals, physicians, so on, would be, have, you'd have to drag them out of the old model into the new model. And many of them just, you know, abandon the ship. But when there's, you know, really more concrete evidence that it works, you can control costs, you can lower utilization, and get a, a better, better product. Um, it'll be very hard to argue. I, I think that's what's happening. You know, people dismiss Cleveland Clinic and Mayo Clinic and say, <coughs> you know, they're different. They're different. They, they're, they're good. <laughs> that's what they are. And they know how to do it. And they have proven it. I mean, the, the data is very compelling. So it's going to get harder and harder to argue against those, those kind of models. The, the, the ultimate uh, ACO is Kaiser. That's obviously. And everything else will be sort of a lukewarm imitation of that. And we've tried this before in the 90s, and those experiments by and large failed. Uh, it's the, the, I was on the board of the Duke uh, University Health System, and we had an HMO. We thought we could manage to take risk and manage to take We failed. We sold the HMO, wrote off millions. And so a lot of failures <coughs> will in fact come forth. See, when a Kaiser physician doesn't spend all day thinking, 
could I get a better deal outside of Kaiser? They're really committed to that. <clears throat> it's a different kind of physician. While in a lot of ACOs, there'll be physicians who belong to an ACO today, but then somebody with a consultant will come to them and say, you could get a better deal here. Or and just like physicians take cardiac surgery out of hospitals and create their own hospitals, so I think a lot of these ACOs won't be very stable over time because they're virtual, they're contractual, and they're not like Kaiser, <coughs> where it's really a company, it's a big company. And so some of them will be very successful, I think, but I think there'll be a lot of failure. So I'm going to uh, give each of you one very quick chance to tell the reporters in this room if you if you could choose one story to see them write over the next couple of months uh, just in a few words tell us what your wish would be to see reporters <coughs> write if you could put yourself in reporters shoes what would be your top priority what do you think the best story would be or the biggest the best area to follow well I don't know. At the end of the day, I'm, you know, I've got two kids. I've had cancer three times. I've become a big believer in why it matters to have good health coverage. So I think it's worthwhile to try to, you know, sort of go to a person level and see what difference does it make in somebody's life if they went from not having coverage or not having reliable coverage to all of a sudden being able to get something and really kind of more than numbers, just what does it do for them? How does it help them sleep at night? Stuff like that. Um, I'd also just put in a quick plug for our website if you're not aware of it. We're the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is not related to the Kaiser Health Plan. Um, but kff.org, we have a lot of information that's available for you. You can also call our communications office and they can kind of help you walk through stuff. We've got explanations of the law, a subsidy calculator, by the way, the rates that have been getting released slowly in states. Mm -hmm. They look um, remarkably like the numbers that are on our subsidy calculator, so I think they're pretty good. So, so we try to just have a lot of issue briefs and explainers and stuff, and I hope you'll take advantage of that resource because it's there for you. Um, I, I would uh, point to the fact that all the major players in this accounting care organization all have brought in the pharmaceutical industry, the insurance industry, the hospitals, the physicians. They've all said we're willing to take less uh, in order to get everybody covered. Not at the table of the consumers, I hate to use that word. People were never at the table. They never had a voice and don't understand <laughs> what it is that they're being, being given. So if I were a reporter, I would really focus in on trying to get the average person to understand what uh, this Affordable Care Act is all about, because it really uh, is going to impact on them much more than it's going to on you know, the provider and insurance pharmaceutical sector. A lot of good stories to be told. And, you know, there are two kinds. The one that I still think is interesting to people and should be uh, reported, what actually happens to people who are uninsured are often underinsured uh, and they get hit with an illness. What happens to their family? What happens to their kid in college? How do they manage somehow? And I think even with Kaiser, I mean, Kaiser is probably the best source of data on just about everything. It's just awesome what they have uh, on their website. <coughs> State facts, for example. Uh, the employer surveys they do, it is an amazing website. But we, <coughs> Kaiser did try to have these vignettes, but they should be refreshed from time to time, sort of human uh, interest story. The other one on the hospital side, there is this hospital in New Jersey, Bayon Hospital, that <coughs> I don't know what the deal is, but I thought they actually took no insurance, and then everyone gets reimbursed. I don't know really what the story is. There's one reporter in New Jersey <coughs> Who, who reports on them, I won't name them, but I have a feeling the stories are written in the hospital. They, they can't, I, I once emailed him and said, have you ever seen their financials? I mean, you have a guy, I don't know who he is, who's a Form 990 specialist, 
Yeah. That's you. Yeah. You gave that talk? Yeah. When you fell on the floor? Yeah, yeah. 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 oh man. <laughs> this guy really knows how to milk that cow. Because the form... Did you plan this? No. No, I didn't. No, your hair was longer then. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> This, I sat there spellbound because he was giving this talk and at one point he actually fell on the floor. I don't know why you did that. I, 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 was, I, was, I was trying to do interpretive dance of a financial swoon of a hospital. Oh, whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> but that turned me on to the Form 990. Now I actually assign it to my students to say, you must learn. But I'm not like you. I, I couldn't. I, uh, this guy really knows how to read it. There's a lot of stuff in those Form 990s. And now, Bayon doesn't have that, I guess, because they're, they're owned by Blackstone or somebody like that. They're owned by for-profit. Yeah, yeah but a lot of for-profits, you can read everything. Yeah. But this is private equity owned, yeah, so right. you can. But still, I, I believe there's a story in Bayon. I myself will research. You know, I haven't been born there. Yeah. So I can tell you, it's a terrible hospital then, and it's a worse hospital now. But they figured out a gimmick. And the gimmick is they have no insurance contracts. So everybody who goes there is, they are paying out of the network. They can make up the numbers. And no contract. And the money was coming in through the windows until somebody figured out what the, the scam that they, that they were doing. Um, but there are a lot of hospitals who just say, I'm going to take a contract at a network. So a $10,000 thing becomes 100000 Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. And under New Jersey law, <laughs> yeah. the insurer has no power. No power whatsoever. Uh, it, it's, it's a, it's, I, I, I'm not sure if it's a scam. I call it curious. I don't understand it. <laughs> and I would like to understand it better. And you could maybe. Yeah. Dig in there. Uh, before Carl wraps this up, I want to point out uh, that, uh, first of all, Uva was talking about some of the uh, data that you can get on the Kaiser Family Foundation website, and some of that you have in your packets. Uh, we, we actually got some of it for you. Um, specific to New Jersey and Pennsylvania, you'll see it on the left side of your packet. Uh, it is everything from uh, uh, population, poverty statistics, health spending statistics, um, you have it on the left side, Medicaid, fact sheets, um, and you can get all this and you can customize it to what information you are looking for on the Kaiser uh, website. Also, I wanted to point out to you that you have an evaluation form, a blue sheet uh, on the right side of your packet. If you would kindly take a moment to fill that out before you leave, we would appreciate that. It helps us to make our programs better. And then for the last few words, I'm going to turn it over to Carl, and he's going to give us our best advice for what, uh, if he were a reporter, what he would follow over the next couple of months. Can you start with a dance, though? Yeah. <laughs> I think we should do the 990s. I think that's, that's clearly the... Um, well, I mean, there's so much to choose from. I, I, I sort of remember that, I, you know, the undocumented immigrants are completely left out of this bill. True. I think that's a really good, that's a really good angle. I think the week of um, October 1st is going to be really interesting because this launch is so huge. You know, this is like four times bigger than Medicare Part D, and Medicare Part D was a mess. I guess the question is whether the mess in the beginning will really matter because it's like a six-month sign-up period. But it's going to be, uh, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be really wild, and, and I think, um, you know, it'll be worth following. Mm -hmm. so. Great. All right, well, thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you very much to all of our panelists for a great discussion.